Hello, everybody. This is Rob Swatsky from the York Campus of Hack. And in this podcast, we'll be continuing our coverage of muscular tissue with our focus on motor units and control of muscle tension. Muscle tension is also known as the force of contraction, and it displays considerable variation. The total tension generated by one muscle fiber depends partly on how fast nerve impulses arrive at the neuromuscular junction. The frequency of stimulation is the number of nerve impulses sent to the NMJ per second. The amount of oxygen and nutrients available to muscle fibers also influences their maximum tension. We know that somatic motor neurons end in axons that are able to branch and form neuromuscular junctions with multiple muscle fibers. A somatic motor neuron and all of the skeletal muscle fibers it stimulates is called a motor unit. On average, there are 150 fibers in a motor unit, with some muscles containing less or more based upon their strength of contraction. All of the muscle fibers in a motor unit contract simultaneously when an action potential is received and relax simultaneously once it's over. A motor unit size has a direct effect on its strength of contraction. Small motor units have less strength of contraction, but are more precise in their movements. For example, the small muscles of the fingers contain muscle units with small numbers of muscle fibers, allowing precise, delicate, and coordinated movements that let one type on a keyboard or play the guitar. Larger muscles, like the quadriceps and hamstrings of the leg, have muscle units with large numbers of fibers, numbering in the thousands. These muscle units allow the muscles to contract with strong tension to generate significant power in movements like jumping and running, but the trade-off is they have less precision. When an action potential reaches the muscle fibers of a motor unit, all of the fibers within the unit contract quickly and at the same time. So for example, in this illustration, we are looking at two motor units where we have two different motor neurons, one colored green and the other colored purple, that are forming neuromuscular junctions with different sets of muscle fibers. This simultaneous contraction of all of the muscle fibers within a muscle unit is called a twitch contraction, and it lasts for about 20 to 200 milliseconds. Twitch contractions can be demonstrated in the lab by electrically stimulating a motor neuron or the muscle fibers themselves within the motor unit. They can also be shown visually in a graph, like you see here, called a myogram, which plots the muscle's force of contraction along the y-axis against the time in milliseconds along the x-axis. The different parts of a twitch contraction are the latent period, the contraction period, the relaxation period, and the refractory period. The latent period is a brief delay period lasting about two milliseconds that happens after the stimulus is applied, shown by the arrow at time zero on the graph, and before the start of the actual contraction. During this phase, the muscle action potential is propagating across the muscle fiber sarcolemma and down the T-tubules. The sarcoplasmic reticulum also releases its calcium ions into the sarcoplasm. The contraction period, shown here in red, occurs next, with the muscle fiber generating its strongest force of contraction. This phase lasts between 10 and 100 milliseconds, with the time varying depending on the type of muscle fiber, be it slow twitch or fast twitch. In this period, the calcium ions released from the SR bind to troponin. Tropomyosin swivels away from the actin, exposing the myosin binding sites. And cross bridges form between the binding sites and the myosin heads of the thick filaments, allowing the power stroke to occur. Next, the relaxation period takes place, which is shown in green on the myogram. 
In this phase, also lasting from 10 to 100 milliseconds, like the contraction period, activities occur that are opposite to those of the contraction period. Calcium ions are pumped back into the SR. The myosin heads are detached from their binding sites on actin. Tropomyosin swivels back around the actin to cover up the myosin binding sites, and the muscle fiber's force of contraction decreases. The last phase of a twitch contraction is called the refractory period and is a property found in all types of muscle fibers and neurons. It occurs when a muscle fiber receives a stimulus and begins to contract and then cannot be excited by a second stimulus for a given amount of time, usually only five milliseconds in skeletal muscle tissue. Think of the analogy of a series of dominoes toppling over. If you want to knock over the dominoes again after they've been toppled, you have to reset them, stand them up, and line them up. Now they're ready to be knocked over again. The dominoes represent the ions, like sodium and calcium ions, that are involved in muscle contraction. The sodium ions are soaking into the muscle fiber at the start of the muscle action potential, and the calcium ions are kicked out of the SR during contraction. During the refractory period, the ions are being reset back to their initial resting concentrations, with the sodium ions pumped out of the fiber back into the extracellular fluid, and the calcium ions actively transported back into the SR. Here we see our single twitch contraction in red that was triggered by a single action potential shown in blue. But the frequency of stimulation can vary considerably in muscle fibers. A muscle fiber can be excited again by a second stimulus immediately after the refractory period, but before the relaxation period. This second stimulus will actually result in a stronger force of contraction than the one generated by the first stimulus. This is called wave summation, where the effect of the later stimuli adds up to a stronger force of contraction in the muscle fiber. There are two variations of wave summation, unfused or incomplete tetanus and fused or complete tetanus. The term tetanus or tetany refers to a muscle's tension or rigidity. In unfused tetanus, a muscle fiber is excited by stimuli occurring 20 to 30 times per second, allowing the fiber to partially but not completely relax in between the stimuli. This generates a prolonged but unsteady contraction where the individual twitches can be seen in the myogram. In fused tetanus, a muscle fiber is excited by stimuli occurring much more rapidly at rates of 80 to 100 times per second. The muscle fiber cannot relax, which results in a steady extended contraction. In contrast to unfused tetanus, the twitches in fused tetanus cannot be seen in a myogram. Why does wave summation and tetanus occur? The answer has to do in part with high calcium ion levels in the sarcoplasm. There is already a high concentration of calcium ions present in the sarcoplasm from the previous stimulus, so the added calcium ions from the SR can continue to bind to troponin and strengthen the force of contraction. Another factor affecting wave summation involves the stretch of the elastic components of muscle tissue such as the tendons and other connective tissues like the epimysium, paramysium, and endomysium. Because the elastic tissues are not given enough time to return to resting length during wave summation, they stay taut, tight, and do not need to stretch very much before the next contraction cycle. Motor unit recruitment is a process that occurs when a muscle needs to generate a stronger force of contraction. 
It does so through the activation of large numbers of motor units, where the weakest ones are brought in or recruited first, and the stronger motor units are added in if more muscle strength is needed. Large motor units are able to generate high tension, high strength, with low precision, while smaller motor units allow muscles to carry out more precise movements, but at a lower tension. This process works well because in order to postpone muscle fatigue, not every motor unit in a whole muscle is actively engaged in muscle contraction at the same time. Motor units in whole muscle are firing asynchronously. Some are in a relaxed state, and these are the ones that will be recruited if the job requires more strength and force of contraction. Muscle tone is the degree of tension generated in muscles at rest. That is the result of weak involuntary contractions of small numbers of motor units. The term flaccid is used to describe muscles that are limp, having no muscle tone. This can result from physical damage to motor neurons, neurological disorders, or electrolyte imbalances. Muscle tone is maintained by groups of motor units that are continuously alternating their activity between contraction and relaxation. Because of the weak force of contraction, no movement is generated through muscle tone, but the muscle is kept firm. Just think of your postural muscles, like the skeletal muscles in your head and neck, that are engaged in tonic contraction, allowing you to maintain a normal viewing posture as you watch this podcast. Tone is also displayed during the regulation of blood pressure by bands of smooth muscle found in the walls of the blood vessels. They can contract involuntarily to increase blood pressure, a process called vasoconstriction, or relax involuntarily to decrease blood pressure, a process called vasodilation. When muscles contract, the contractions can be classified as either isotonic or isometric. Isotonic contractions are used to move the body or to move objects. Isotonic contractions involve a muscle maintaining the same constant tension while the muscle length is either increasing or decreasing. There are two types of isotonic contractions, concentric and eccentric. A concentric isotonic contraction involves flexion of the muscle where the muscle shortens in length, pulls on a tendon, and generates movement. When muscles engage in flexion, the body part or object is brought in towards the body, which reduces the angle at the joint. Raising a book from a table towards your face using your biceps brachii of your upper arm is an example of concentric isotonic contraction. Eccentric isotonic contraction is the opposite movement, where the muscle undergoes extension and increases in length during contraction. When you lower the book back down towards the table, away from your body, increasing the angle at the joint, your biceps brachii lengthens while it is still able to contract. During isometric contraction, the muscle does not change in length because it does not produce enough tension to move the object. Holding a book away from your body in a fixed position, as shown in this photograph, is an example of isometric contraction. Other examples of this type of movement include the muscles involved in maintaining posture and those that help keep joints stable while others are actively engaged in movement.